start whenever you're ready. Okay, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Okay. So, uh, Benito has given us a wonderful talk on the calibration um, practicalities of VLBI in general. And Mark's already given us a wonderful talk on the calibration infrastructure in CASA. And so I'm really going to be um, hopefully complementing those talks with a few details on uh, some of the specifics of the CASA VLBI tasks that I've been involved in implementing. And I hope that the, con the interference uh, between our talks is constructive. Uh, um, yeah, another title slide. Okay, so in practice, once you've handled the um, VLBI specific way of dealing with gain, gain and amplitude calibration and system temperature, the only thing that was really missing from CASA to do VLBI was fringe fitting. And Nita has discussed a fair bit about fringe fitting. I'm gonna really only talk about fringe fitting. I'm gonna look at VLBI from the point of view of fringe fitting, why it's necessary and um, how you do it, as well as a little bit of history. So CASA uh, was developed by NRAO starting in the 1990s. It's long, for a long time, it's been used for the VLA and it's also been adopted by ALMA. And there was always a plan that it would be a generic package that would be able to do interferometric grade um, but radio interferometric uh, data reduction for any array, more or less. Um, but the implementation for a long time didn't have a fringe fitting task, and that's essentially the, the only thing that was really missing. And uh, so that's what I talk about. So Jive got involved in this because the Black Hole CAM project offered funding for us to work on CASA and make it finally VOBI ready. And of course, as you've probably seen, that it was successfully used. Michael Janssen is going to talk, I think, about uh, his work developing a pipeline that was used as part of the EHT project to image the black hole that we all saw in the newspapers around the world. And as a result of that, what came out of that is that you can now do VLBI in CASA, which is why we're all here. Now, an interlude, which I've attributed to Bracewell, but I don't think he's, I don't think he said it, but I just thought it would be convenient to have somebody eminent to attribute it to. Now, the thing is, when you're looking at phase, a complex exponential of phase that's a function of anything at all, then to, locally it's going to look like a Fourier transform pair of coordinates. So you can take the derivative, you can take the derivative of your function of something and then introduce a new coordinate, which is that derivative, and then you automatically have a Fourier transform pair. And we're going to see how that becomes a thing when we do the, um, when we when we develop the theory of uh, fringe fitting. So again, this is, this is something that Benito showed, but it bears repeating, I think, that when you're doing interferometry, you're trying to measure the uh, coherence of an electromagnetic field. And to do that, you want to synchronize your, you want to synchronize um, your observations. So a very important part of that is you, you calculate a geometric delay that you add to the various antennas so that your, your observations are then of the same wavefront. And that's, you know, that's how you make sure that your coherence, uh, your coherence measurements are meaningful. Then you downmix that, those, um, observations and you add the you add the uh, geometric delay before you correlate, and that's that's your end product. So what you're really doing is looking at the um, projected baseline uh, at equal times, and turning that into something, some measurement of the uh, the sky. And any time you get the delay wrong, if your geometric delay isn't correct, then that degrades your quality. It means that your phases are not aligned and then you need to correct for that. Now, and in VLBI, it gets, of course, much worse because here you have, I've drawn a picture of the earth, which is rotating and you've got your two antennas now, but in different places on the earth and you're still trying to do the same thing. 
and we have a program called CALP that tries to do this and it bears in mind um, ocean loading and plate tectonics and atmospheres as best as it can. But fundamentally you're using now different clocks at different stations and you're using different uh, local oscillators. So your frequency standard is different. And that means there's a, a residual degree of um, uncertainty that you don't know a priori when you're calibrating the data. And that's what uh, fringe fitting is designed to deal with. So we, uh, yeah, so when you have a delay, it corresponds to a slope in your phase against frequency, right? Because the higher the frequency for a given delay, the further the phase front advances. So there's actually some physics behind that. And when you have, if there is a specific delay, you should be able to pick it out quite cleanly, you would hope. So here's, um, here's an example of uh, the VLBI procedure of fringe fitting, right? I'm not talking yet about how, how it works. I'm just simply showing what you're doing as Benito did. And you see that before you do anything, you have every, every different color in this plot is a different baseline. And you see there are slopes of various kinds. And th these are the different uh, sub bands or spectral windows in cars of talk. Uh, so they're not aligned and they're sloping because of the residual slopes from instrumental effects. And this, this manual phase color, as we call it, it uh, in VLBI, Procedures, you, they're actually use phase color tones to try and line up the um, different spectral windows. But here we're doing it by simply looking at a bright calibrated source and saying that um, if we if we have enough signal to noise that we can fringe fit all our delays and rate and you know, just the delays actually. If you take the delays out of all of these things and make sure that they're the phases across each spectral window are reduced to zero, then you know that in any other scan that you look at, they, the, the phase across the bands will be aligned. So we'll see an example of that here. Once this is after you've applied the manual phase color, and you can see that every different color on a different scan, we're looking at a different scan, so there are residual delays, but they're now all completely aligned across the different bands. So that means that we can now do a multi-band fringe fit and get higher signal to noise and our, our life is good. And once we've done that, we correct that and now our phase is flat and we're you know this is as if we're looking at if we if we're looking at a compact source which we will be when we're trying to do the fringe fit and this is our our calibrator source so you want it to be a nice compact source that looks quite a lot like a point source and once you've done that you have a nice flat phase and then you know you'll be okay to apply that to your target source and then you'll be able to do imaging and your life will be good so uh, one thing about manual phase cal is, of course, that you're going to apply, you, 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 you do your manual phase cal on one short section of a very bright source, your brightest source. And then when you do it, you write down a zero rate term, right? Because you don't, when you're going to apply it, you apply it to the whole data set and you really want to take out the delays. You don't want to be extrapolating the, delay, the rate term, otherwise it will completely ruin your data. So you'll see in the tutorial and all of the practicalities of this are covered in the tutorial for VLBI with CASA. You'll see that that's a very important uh, detail. And this is something that uh, when you do the multi-band, delay and you want to apply it in CASA, this is a CASA specific detail, you'll see that you know you, you make a new multiband delay table, you can choose what file name you like for that. And I always like to call it MBD for multiband delay. So you add a new one and you have chosen your appropriate solution interval and you've told it that you want to combine the spectral windows here. And you, in this case, I've said, I want to do it for the whole of this field because that all effectively amounts, that's my, uh, phase calibrator source, so I want to do the whole thing in one go. And because I'm, I'm using really good data, test data, I can afford to say that I don't, I'm not interested in anything with a signal to noise ratio of less than 50. In practice, you're gonna have much smaller numbers than that if you're doing, you know, real as astronomy. These are the, these are the, this is my single band delay, my, uh, my manual phase cal delay that I've had to apply. And these are the two a priori calibrations that we've imported. But what the, the point is that when you apply this calibration, you have this SPW map thing, and you don't want to say anything about how the um, amplitude calibrations and the, the manual phase cal, those are all fine. So you kind of give those empty lists in Python. 
and then here, this is the interesting term because you take your, your multi-band delay in Kaz's bookkeeping is given a spectral window number and that can only have one spectral window number and it will use the lowest spectral window in the set. So if you do it for all the bands, that will be probably zero. And so you say, I want every each of my eight bands should get the, uh, the you use the um, spectral window zero data from the multiband delay and it looks like this. And the point is you can do other things with this syntax. This is, this is by adjusting the syntax that will allow you, if you're cunning enough to um, apply continuum calibration to a spectral line uh, observation as, so I, I put that in because Mark promised I would and I thought I might be better off if I kept his promise for you. So again, it was asked yesterday, what happens if you have you know, you you have more than one band, but they're widely separated in frequency space. Can you still do a multiband delay? And of course, the well, not of course, but as it happens, the answer is yes. Whatever, whenever you do the multiband delay, we'll take a frequency grid that goes from the lowest frequency you have to the highest frequency, and is uniform across that uh, frequency space. Now, that's that means if you have widely separated bands at the moment, then you will be, um, and you know, you're going to do a We'll come to it later, but you're going to do a Fourier transform across that space. You put all the data onto one frequency grid and then take the Fourier transform of that. And that will be um that will be quite an expensive process when you're Fourier transforming a lot of zeros, but it does work and you know it doesn't cause a lot of big problems. And the same is true of Alma, where the frequency grids are not completely uniform between bands. So, you know, in practice you're in when I make a uniform frequency grid, I'm moving the data from a frequency to a very nearby frequency, and I use only nearest neighbor interpolation, and that could be improved, and we're working on a method to improve that, but you know, it does all work in practice. So here is uh, another thing Benito told you about, that when you're observing in VLBI, you often want to use a phase calibrated near your target source, your target source is not strong enough to fringe fit on directly, or also it might be um, non-compact, so it would be unpleasant to work with in fringe fitting. So you pick a nice strong calibrated near it, and then you alternate the scans. And as Benito said, you want to alternate fast enough that you're inside the coherence time of the atmosphere, which is frequency dependent. And then you know, you're going to be linearly interpolating the solutions from the phase calibrator on either side. So it's very important that that's a meaningful operation. And whether it preserves absolute astrometry, we know Benito suggested it did. And if you know exactly where your calibrator source is and it's close enough that your atmosphere can be meaningfully treated as exactly the same as your target source, then you're good. And if any of those things become less true, then you're starting to work in compromises. So the details of this phase transfer, uh, you know, how you exactly the syntax and how you do that in CASA, that's all shown in detail in the tutorial that you'll be working through. So I haven't uh, put up a lot of the Python syntax here. And there's one other piece of, well, folklore or general practice that we've seen the, the bandwidth. Uh, so the band pass for each band has, a, has this characteristic slope, but it's very, strong in the middle and quite weak at the end. And you do band pass calibration to bring all that to a uniform level. But you know, when at the very edges of your frequency band, the amplitude is very low and you might reasonably wonder if you can actually trust the phase at all. So there is a tradition and a, a long established practice that you should flag two or three points at the outside edge of each frequency, uh, of each spectral window, before you fringe fit so that you don't get you know your fringe fitter doesn't get misled or upset by any of the bad data at the edges and as we there was a question in the previous talk uh, how should you pick a reference antenna when you're fringe fitting and the answer Benito gave is also the one I'll give that whenever possible you use the biggest antenna because you'll get the most signal to noise ratio there and that's Steffelsberg if you're using the EVN, it's Alma if you've got something like the HT. If you don't have that, then you pick a ref one that's geographically central and of course one that's uh, present in as many scans as possible. And then one last thing is that 
you really always need when you're fringe fitting unless you're you have a, if you have enormous confidence in your pipeline then that's fair enough but if you are if you are uncertain in any way you should always prop the calibrated data right because let's go right back to here this is what happened this on the left is your data before you do any fringe fitting and this is the data after your fringe fitting. it's really easy to look at it and say this is now nice and flat the phases are flat across frequency and they're at zero and you you know you either you average across the whole time or you look at uh subsections of your data in time and you check that this really happened because if it did happen then you're safe to go onto imaging but if if you don't check and it isn't flat then you'll be producing um complete nonsense and your life will be bad and you can it's very easy to look and see so i strongly recommend that uh, you always go and inspect your data after you've fringe fitted to at least some level to make sure that things are what you wanted them to be like so okay now mark has told you in some detail about the measurement equation it's a completely generic framework for discussing calibration of uh, radio interferometric data and it's at the heart of cars's data cars's um algorithms everything in cars is done along the lines of the measurement equation and everything all calibration effects are implemented as these two by two complex matrices called joint matrices but as a user when you're doing fringe fitting you tend to be thinking about delays and um you know delays and delay rates and of course those are internally translated into Jones matrices and back out again as appropriate. So when you are plotting your uh, the calibration parameters that you found, it'll be plotted. You know, you'll you'll be able to see the delays in terms of nanoseconds or picoseconds, and that's what, and internally it will be translated back into Jones matrices. But you don't really need to worry about that. I mean, that's uh, beautiful and true and of fundamental importance to the software and to the mathematics of the procedures but it doesn't really matter to you very much now when i started working on the fringe fitter for casa there was already the established model of apes and of course apes has been the vobi data reduction package the industry standard for many years and the apes well for many people okay there, there's also hops and there are people who use hops but in EV, the EVN world, uh, APES has always been the dominant package and the fringe fitting, the way APES does it, was the industry standard that we wanted to um, come as close to as possible. So it was an explicit design goal for the Casa fringe fitter to be as like the APES uh, version as possible, to have wherever possible, to have the same options, to have the same results. And, to, you know, this was, a necessary step to gain the confidence of the radio astronomy community, the VBI community. So I went back to the original paper by Schwab and Cotton, and Bill Cotton was actually the implementer of the task in APES, and he wrote also the corresponding paper on how you do it. So I went back to that and looked uh, at exactly what they do. And this is, there's two stages when you do a uh, fringe fitting, two possible stages. First, you do a baseline based fit uh, with a Fourier transform method, which we we're going to talk about first. And that's where your reference station is most important because, you know, you, you do all of your baselines to the reference station to get a initial estimate for your delays and rates from the finished fitter. And the better they are, and then you cut off, so you have a signal to noise cutoff at the Fourier transform stage. And only baselines that are higher than that will be included in the global optimization that comes next. So the better it is, the better your life is. And so here we are. We've got the true phase and the measured phase. We don't know the true phase. We do know the measured phase. And this is like a tiny fraction of the measurement equation where instead of, you know, we're for just one hand of correlation, uh, we, we do the two uh, correlation hands completely independently and fringe fitting at the moment. There are possibilities that we may adjust that later but at the moment the two correlation hands are treated completely independently and we want to we have um a observed phase at each baseline at each time and at each frequency you can see we've got and we assume that we're, we're fitting a model essentially that 
a first order Taylor series expansion around some time and frequency for some small time and frequency window will be a we can fit that to the data and as we discussed before that means that you can think of this as a Fourier transform so if you take the Fourier transform of your visibility data you can read off the peak delay you know where where in the delay and fringe rate space you have a peak and that's your best fit for a model for the those parameters and when you apply those parameters you'll get uh the phase is flat and then you'll you'll be calibrated as best you can or you know you'll be ready to uh, improve that calibration at the next step so here you are this is a Fourier uh this is the basis for the Fourier space and then you know when I started doing this this is uh industry standard and it had been used before apes this wasn't introduced with apes but when I started implementing it, I looked at this and I thought, well, this is, you know, very beautiful. And I, but I wanted to see it for myself, right? So I, I took some, when I was originally working on this in, in a Python prototype, I took some data and I did the 2D Fourier transform and I plotted it to see if this was really, you know, what it really looked like when you plotted the uh, Fourier transform of the data, do you actually see the delay and rate peaks the way you'd expect it. And this is raw data on the left and you really do see what you expect to see. It's uh, you know a sharp, there's some noise and then there's a sharp peak. And of course the relative heights of the, of the peak and the noise tell you your SNR ratio. And in practice, you would like to have, you know, a, a finer grained resolution when you do this Fourier transform uh, approach. So you, in fact, what you do is you pad the data with zeros and that means you, in Fourier space, that corresponds to smoothing it, and then you get this nice, beautiful smooth surface, which is your, which you can uh, read off the delay and rate off. And then on each baseline, you then have an estimate for your delay and rate. And then again, the Schwab and Cawthon method says that's fine, but at the moment we've only used data from each station to the reference station so there's a lot of baselines that we haven't made any use of at all and you see in this uh in this expression there might be derivatives of the actual source phase that interfere with your estimates so you you know you might be contaminated by some baseline dependent effects uh that are not ge geometric that are not corrections to a geometric delay they've come from somewhere else and you can reduce that and make your life better if you fit a model of delay and rate. It's the same linear delay and rate model, but now you say you're going to do it on each each um, antenna. Pop, each antenna has its own delay and rate, and then you fit that to all of the baselines, and you do a global minimization where you also use the weights for the weights that you've established by other the amplitude calibration you used to weight the, the um, data in your solver and then you throw that into a big uh, standard least squares minimizers and then you have an improved estimate the way you've used uh, you the ideally you've used every baseline's information and you've weighted it accordingly to your estimates of how good it is so that that method was introduced by Schwab and cotton that was uh, implemented in apes and um, with one or two implementation detail adjustments that's also what we use in cars though, right and uh when we were developing this we went to quite a lot of trouble to compare our results from the cars implementation with the apes implementation we, and we we checked that it was producing similar results in 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 all cases and uh that's it. So once you've done that, um, once you've uh, found those parameters, you, that's your that's your uh, fringe fitting calibration, and you can apply it to your heart's content. Now, in doing that, for your phase calibrator, you generally uh, you know you you take your phase calibrator to be compact. You want it to be like a point source as far as possible. But as Benisa said, in VLBI, not everything, even even compact sources are not as compact as you might hope. So things look like a point source, but not completely like a point source. 
and um, you can address that uh, with source models now. There's going to be a lecture on self calibration and another lecture on imaging, so I'm not going to go into much detail. All, I'm, all I really want to say is that, first of all, uh, fringe fitting on your phase calibrator, you, if you don't use a source model that of your own, then you're implicitly using the a point source as a model and fitting the best point source you can to it. And that's usually fine, that, that will work. Uh, that will be good enough for most purposes. Now, I don't know your purposes. Maybe it's not good enough for you, but for many purposes, it's good enough to assume that your phase calibrator uh, can be fringe fitted as a point source. And if you want to, you can do self calibration. And CASA, the, the, the main point I want to make here is that CASA does support source models. You, it has its own way of doing it. And if you have a source model, you can import it into CASA and uh, the fringe fitter can seamlessly make use of it and give you better results than you would do without it. Uh, if your source models, if you have source models in that you've produced from apes as fits images, it's not currently completely trivial to import them into CASA. And as far as I know, I'm the only person who really knows how to do that. But if you really want to do that, I'm quite happy to tell you and work with you how to do that. NREO, um, have expressed an interest in making this a supported functionality and I've given them all the information on how to do that and we're waiting you know for them to have the resources to implement and support that but it is it's all possible it can all it can all be done and here are some uh remarks about the implementation okay so some people have asked can we combine the polarizations because you know the atmospheric effects of delay if it's just an atmospheric delay, then it may well be uh, that it's the same for both polarizations and you might be able to do a better job if you could average it or use the crosshand polarization data. And we don't support any of that somehow. At the moment, we don't support any uh, ways of combining the polarizations. You have to do the two independently. As Mark has told you, there is some syntax, which he has shown you that allows you to handle arrays where some antenna only have one polarization and others have two polarization. It used to be that that would flag all the data and that was quite annoying. And now it doesn't do that. We can, we can support that. Uh, we have um, a poll convert program it was written by Eva Marti Vidal and that allows you to convert uh, antenna that we're observing in X, Y, uh, polarizations, you can convert that to left and right handed polarizations after correlation, but before you really do any other data processing. And ideally, you should arrange for that to be done at your correlation site before they hand you the data because it's, you know, it's something that you really want done by support uh, scientists. And Jive does now offer that, I believe, for EVM data where appropriate. And the Casa French Fitter has been in active development with the Rings project recently. I implemented um, functionality that would allow you to uh, model the dispersion term of the ionosphere in uh, the French Fitter data. Now that becomes important as your spec, your fractional spectral, as your fractional bandwidth becomes large, that becomes important. And it's already important when you drop down to P band observations that, 300 megahertz, I think it is. And it's also crucial if we want to be able to handle low far long baseline data, which is a kind of VLBI data in a way. And we would like to be able to make CASA appropriate for data reduction there. And you know, we have tested the fringe fitter with dispersion on low far data and it works, but we're you know, in the process of seeing how that can be fitted into the low far long baseline pipeline more generally. Uh, so that's happening and you know development is actively ongoing we're still working on uh improving the finish fitter and we're committed to you know we have a institutional commitment that we are going to be working uh on the finish fitter and make and continuing to develop casa for vlbi if you decide that casa is a good package for you because you're familiar with it or because you you know it you 
for whatever reason. If you want to use CASA for VLBI, you can be secure that that will be possible for the foreseeable future and it will continue to get better. And we offer user support. You can email people at Jive uh, or the EVN for EVN data. And we're integrated into the NRAO's ticketing system for providing cars as support. If you have problems or questions that you need us to look at, that can be arranged through them. And again, this is our final reminder that you should always plot your data, right? If, whenever you're calibrating VOBI calibration, a lot of the time you need to, you need to, um, it's, it's not, in many cases, it's not something you, that you can just have a pipeline, run it through the pipeline and everything will be fine. And you can just go and have a cup of coffee while your machine grinds away and you'll come back and there'll be a beautiful image ready for you. A lot of steps, uh need need to be um adjusted by hand you need to look at things you need to inspect your data and you know i've seen in earlier iterations of tutorials where we've had cars of your bi sometimes things go wrong and if you don't check you don't know what's gone wrong you should always you should always uh plot your data after calibrating to make sure it really did what you want and there are some you know that the diagnostics for that are fairly simple so it, there's no reason not to do that and i think i'm a little bit ahead of time but i'm quite happy to stop here and we can have questions and then maybe you can have a slightly early break because why not thanks des that's uh, always good to be ahead of time than later on um so uh has anyone got any questions i will pass it over to uh, mark who will be collating them Indeed. Um, well, we're getting quite a few of them, so maybe we'll fill some of the time that uh, there's left over. Um, so the first question is, how is the signal to noise ratio of the fringe fitting solutions calculated in CASA? Right, now the, the answer is um, as far as possible in the same way as it was done in apes. So I, you know, the theoretical justification for that is perhaps not entirely clear to me, but uh, as far as possible, I, I looked at the original code from apes and reproduced it so that if you have an intuition about what you think is good based on apes measurements, then you, that intuition should be transferable to CASA. Obviously, I'd like to have an a priori answer of exactly what that should be mathematically, but this is uh, what we have instead for now. I hope that answers the, 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 the question to whoever asked it. Um, the next one is, um, how is the fringe fitting done across the wide bands? For instance, SX band you mentioned, in particular ionosphere and source structure causing large phase variations across the wide band. I think you mostly answered this, but I you might I, mean, I, I, I can uh, repeat and maybe elaborate. You just take your phase data across the spectral, you know, as a function of frequency, and you just put it all onto one big frequency grid and take the Fourier transform, and then, you know, for the Fourier transform stage, and then once you've got that estimate, you put it into the uh, global fringe fitter, which can trivially use all the model and fit the difference and you know you might be worried that the assumption that your your delay and rate are you know completely characterize the phase across the band may not be true and you might be right to have that concern but the fringe fitter will do its very best to give you the best um estimates of delay and fringe rate assuming those things are true and if you're lucky we i mean we've tried it on sx data and it seems to work okay it's not been uh, it's not in production in any sx based instrument that i know of but you know we'll uh if it turns out that there are better things to do then we'll, we'll um look into that but at the moment it seems to be okay and then um... Um, the next question is, is the global fringe fitting significantly better than the baseline-based approach? 
Well, I, I would be happy to um, pass that question on to Benito if you would like it, but um, the folklore suggests that it is, yes. I mean, you're using all the data instead of just some of the data, right? Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> you basically win by a square root of the number of subbats that you have. So that's the main improvement that you have. If you really get good solution from the beginning, you may not see any significant differences from one to the other. But on the cases where you have signal to noises of around 10 or 7, then it may do a huge improvement from one to the other. Yeah, this of course ties in with the somewhat controversy between, um, especially in high frequency uh, VLBI, um, the school of hops and the school of apes, um, where uh, the problem with a with a, a baseline based approach is, of course, that if you're not careful, you're introducing um, closure errors because you're you're um, Apply, may, may be applying phase corrections, uh, which should be largely station-based, um, but you might apply a different phase correction uh, on different baselines to the same station. So, and, and that would affect the, the final outcome of your, your science. Uh, so that's not a good thing. So a, a purely baseline-based approach uh, can't really work. You always have to reconcile uh, what you find there um, and and apply it correctly before you can do any imaging. Okay. Um, next question is. Um, what was changed in plotting our calibration application to get from the right hand panel of slide 10 to the left hand panel of slide 11? That's a very. Uh, uh, slide 11 doesn't have any plots on my screen. So is it, are we talking about these two? Is it, am I, I'm still sharing the screen, right? Yes, you are. So we're talking about this slide? Yes, uh, I'm, I, I suppose so. Okay. Um, right, so the, the left-hand side is after the uh, manual phase cal, but before the uh, multiband, and the right-hand side is the same data after the multiband printer. Sorry, Des, can you repeat that? <laughs> I can. The left-hand side is after you've done the manual phase cal, so your phases are now aligned across the bands, but they're still residual slopes. And you're looking at a different scan from the one you used for the manual phase cal. The right-hand side is after you've solved for the multiband uh, fringe fit and applied the corrections. Okay, yes, I've got that. So this is, um, you know, this is, this is a site you're on the way on the left, you've got all your phases aligned, but they're still not flat and not at zero. And the right hand side is, you know, the, this is what you want to see when you finish fringe fitting. This is what you should see on your calibrator source. So the next question is, assume we have a strong enough target source, so no need for a separate calibrator. First one usually implicitly uses a point source model for the fringe fitting. Then one calibrates images and self calibrates and finally comes up with a source model. But could one get any benefits from rerunning the initial fringe fitting with this derived model of the source? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. And in um, self calibration, surely applying the model and then redoing the fringe fit is one of the steps of that can be used in self calibration. Okay, and then the next question. Is there a covariance between time and frequency variation of the phase so that fringe fitting needs to take 
into account? Well, I mean, what we've done here is we've modeled the phase as a first order Taylor's expansion of, uh, of delay and rate, time and frequency. And of course you can have higher order terms and you know, you're just fitting a linear model and hoping for the best. And that is usually good enough. But while the um, in frequencies across the frequency axis, right? The, the frequency act, when you have a slope in the frequency axis that corresponds to a physical delay. And that's really a real physical phenomenon. And you expect there to be a true answer there in a sense in the time dimension, you're really just doing a, a, a first order Taylor series and saying, well, look, everything's locally linear. That's the whole point of Taylor series. And it's completely true that uh, mathematically, as, as you make your intervals in time or frequency larger, then that model will uh, start to show signs of strain. And But the question is, do you have enough information to do a better job? Uh, and is it, is it useful to try and hit, fit higher order terms in a Taylor series or a more sophisticated model. And so far, uh, there hasn't really been anyone who's made a compelling claim that there is. So what we tend to do instead is we tend to look at other effects, physical effects like dispersion that we know we can characterize and we try to kind of look for those in the data instead of just expanding the Taylor series to higher order terms and seeing what happens. Um. Okay, and then there's a last question, um, which says, could you please elaborate on using FFT mode method for initial guess? Um, well, the point is with, I guess, uh, I, I can elaborate in various different ways. I guess this is the plot that shows you um, you know, when you take raw data and do the two-dimensional FFT, you get a good result, right? And that's the, the essentially, you know, if you're fitting a linear model and you could do it globally, then you might say, well, what's what's the added value of doing an FFT uh, stage first? Um, there are, the main reason is that you're working in phase, right? phases are circular and that means that you have ambiguities. If you're looking for a straight line in, in non-phase type data, then you, often, you wouldn't necessarily need to do a Fourier transform. I mean, you're really trying to fit a straight line to a bunch of points. And you might say a Fourier transform is a kind of roundabout way of doing that. But the problem is you can fit lots of straight lines because they can wrap. And the Fourier transform are kind of allows you to pick a, a nice one that you know will be near a value where you can reasonably expect a global method to converge without getting lost in the possible uh, ambiguities. So for, for a lot, I mean, for a lot of purposes, you, if you have really good data, you can do the, as we've, we've, we've Benito has said, you, can, you could do the Fourier transform method and you wouldn't even need to refine it, it would be good enough. But, uh, if you want to use all the data and all the baselines, you have, you're faced with the problem of how would you integrate all the different baseline estimates of the delays and rate, and then you, 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 you don't. You move instead to a model where each, you have an antenna-based model that, 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 where each antenna is modeled in all of its different baselines, but you use the same model on a per antenna basis, and then you can fit all the data. Um, and then you can you know, incorporate all the data and do a better job. Uh, so, you know, the, the Fourier method is a, is a useful and helpful bootstrap that allows you to then do as few possible to allow, allows the global method to converge fast. Is that enough elaboration, do you think? I hope so. Um, we've got one question from Amy. I think it's from uh, the previous question before because the slide numbers are actually different. Uh, with the online one and this one, so I'll oh, okay. uh, I'll put Amy through, and it might be easier for her to explain. So you should be allowed to chat now, Amy. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can. we can. Great. Yeah. So I was using the uh, PDF <laughs> numbering. Um, so it okay. looks like what I actually should have referred to as slide nine and slide ten, uh, as you have them labeled. Yeah, so. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Okay. So, uh, 
on on the left of the slide you have the which you didn't ask i think but the, the left of the slide is your data before the manual phase calibration procedure and the right of it is after the manual phase calibration so you've done this is all on your bright um your bright calibrator okay so you your this is where you've done the uh fringe fit independently for each spectral window and you've established that on the data that you originally fringe fitted it's taken out all the, the the phase variation it's now completely flat okay then you apply that um calibration to the whole data set and you look at another stretch of data and that's what you have on the left here of this slide this is a question right yes okay so it's maybe different scan but this is a this is a different source okay looking through a different part of the sky at a different time and you see there are now again uh slopes the corresponding to delays that you haven't completely eliminated uh but the point is that they're now all aligned across band so that when you do it you will be able to use all the data in one go great thanks very much okay Okay, is there any more questions, uh, Mark? I can't see any myself. No, not that I can see. Okay, well, if there isn't any more questions, we might as well, uh, well, thanks again, Des and Benito for the, for the lectures this morning, and thanks everyone for their participation. Um, it's been, I've learned some stuff as well. I didn't know some of these things were implemented yet. Um, so we should, uh, probably take an early break and then if anyone else has any other questions drop them onto the the matter most um, so the next thing we're going to do will be the data processing b um, it's going to be back in the plenary but we're not going to use the breakout rooms i think elsa if that's right no that's the plan so the breakout rooms were not a big success yesterday it was too much work to get everybody in um, so we'll, we'll do the plenary and what I will try to do is have the breakout rooms activated so when people have a question, uh, the, the tutors can have a one on one or so several people with a similar question in one room. Um, this depends on the functionality if the co hosts can also move the participants, but this is uh, at least it's optional at this point and otherwise all the questions can go through the, the Mattermost chats and everything. It seems to be working very well for the lectures at least so. Let's keep that up and running. So we're going to close this session in a bit and move to the, the plenary session.